right. So uh, this morning we are going to be recapping um, Second Thessalonians chapter three. So let's open our Bibles to Second Thessalonians three. Right, great. Um, remember that the central theme of um, Second Thessalonians two, Second Thessalonians, we agreed that it was um, be alert, Christ will return, and uh, we see in chapter three, like a practical way that we can be alert while we're waiting for Christ's return. Um, and like we've seen too, if you look at First Thessalonians chapter five, you see the instructions there. You see a similarity with uh, this last chapter of. Um, Second Thessalonians 2, that we see Paul giving out instructions to the church on things that they can practically do that keeps them alight, alert while they are waiting for Christ's return. Um, on Monday, I was listening online, and we kept mentioning how uh, because Christ is coming, we shouldn't just be there existing and just waiting. We should actively be doing something. And that's what this, sit down, Skyler. That's what this uh, part of the scripture is talking about, right? How to be alert, how to what exactly we can be doing while we're waiting for Christ's return. That is not just a passive process. It's something that we must um, actively keep doing. So let's uh, we'll go over the chapter, we'll draw lessons. Um, I have a couple of questions that we can discuss and talk around. Uh, and I trust that God will um, bring light to our hearts in Jesus' name. So um, verse 1 says, Finally, brothers, pray for us. I'll pause here. Uh, the first thing for me that drew my attention or caught my attention was that Paul, um, being a, a kind of church leader that he was, was actually asking for prayer. Uh, and I see so much humility in that because so many times um, some of us just get very comfortable because maybe we've been doing this work of the gospel over and over and over again. If I was in Paul's shoes, I probably wouldn't maybe think that they should pray for me because, oh, okay, I've even evangelized to this group of people I'm talking about, and they've heeded the call. Like, I've done this thing severally, back to back to back, right? And it has yielded fruit. The thought will probably not even occur to me to actually even ask for prayers. But we see here that Paul was humble enough as a minister of the gospel to actually ask for prayer, not even from fellow church leaders, right? From his followers or from the church that he established. And I see that as something that we can learn as ministers of the gospel, that we never get to the point that we trust our own ability or our own experience. We can do this thing over and over and over and over again and we get comfortable with it and think, oh, okay, you know how to just, you know how to get people's attention in a few minutes, you know how to have great conversation starters, you know how to enter anywhere and just share the gospel. I think that we are self-sufficient in ourselves. We must remember to always be like Paul, to be humble enough to know that um, it is God that enables us to do this thing. That it's not based on our experience, it's not based on our own ability. It is God that enables us to do this. And that's the first um, lesson for me from there. Another thing I see uh, there also is that, you know, when we talk about... Um, when we say Paul says pray for us, we're also thinking somewhere in our mind that we're thinking about, oh, okay, a pastor or somebody that has a ministry and all of that. But I also want us to see ourselves as ministers of the gospel. We may not all be called to um, pastor over a church or pastor over a flock, right? Or to go into pulpit ministry. But all of us as Christians have been called into preaching the gospel. So we're all ministers of the gospel. And we must see ourselves as such. So that when you see this prayer, you're not sidelining yourself and say, okay, let's pray for them, us who are here. We are also ministers of the gospel, and we must see ourselves uh, as such. Um, so a continuation of that says, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored. Um, I see here that Paul gives a specific prayer point. There's a particular thing he's asking them to pray for or to pray about. Right, uh, and it's it's interesting because um, Paul could have asked them to pray for anything else. Maybe pray for the persecution, like like to be less, you know. Pray for good health, pray for all of those things. But we see that in Paul's heart, what was most important for him 
was that the word of God should spread rapidly. And that should be our mindset too as ministers of the gospel. That that should be our number one priority. That that's what should obsess our whole being. That wherever we are, we're thinking about how can the word of God spread quickly in whatever it is that we've been called to do. Right? That we don't um, personal, we don't project other concerns, other needs higher than this need to share the gospel. Is it good to pray for personal needs? Of course, right? We should pray for good health, we should pray for finances, we should pray for resources. But at the top of our list should be that this word of God is spread and is spread quickly. Right? That should be the number one prayer point when we think of ministries, when we think of ministers of the gospel, when we think of men and women of God that are doing ministry. That before we begin to think of praying that, oh, they should have a larger, um, larger auditorium or larger reach to people, that the first thing in our mind is that this work that God has put in the hands of these people, that it spread, it grows, right? That they pay attention to it. And that should be our own um, priority. And we see that that's the only thing that Paul actually asked them to pray for, right? That the word of the God, that the word of the Lord will spread quickly. That's what he asked them to pray for. And that's, that's, that shows how obsessed he was with the work that God had placed in his hand. And that should be our mindset too, as ministers of the gospel. Next, we see that this prayer point is actually twofold, that the word of God spreads mightily and be honored as happened amongst you. Um, so we see that there's also a place for the people that we have been called to minister to, listening and accepting this word that God has given. And we see that there's a place um, for which God actually changes and transforms the lives of men. So it's not just by eloquence of speech. It's not just by knowing this thing in your head, that there's a place uh, where God is able to turn the hearts of the people that you've been called to minister to, to actually accepting this truth. And another thing I see is also a demand on the minister of the gospel himself. You know, he talks about how the word of God was honored. And I see that, that there's a way we can hold or preach the gospel with honor and reverence that comes from the minister of the gospel himself, right? Some people just, you know, take the... Um, this whole idea of preaching the gospel lightly or as a joke or as, as nothing serious, but there's a reverence and an honor that a minister of the gospel can have for the gospel, that when you share, when you evangelize, the people that you're preaching to or talking with can actually see that honor and the reverence that you have, and they can emulate it also. So we must um, pay attention to the gospel, the true gospel that has been given to us, and we must honor it and we must reverence it and we should also have not just a head knowledge that our life should also be um, changed and transformed. People should be able to see your life and see that this gospel that you're talking about is alive and is active and has the ability to transform your own life. That this person that is sharing this gospel is a number one testimony of how much his life has been transformed. You know, I was looking at um, somebody's status maybe two days ago and she was talking about how um, professing believers, maybe on Sundays, you know, they put Christian captions, put um, things relating to church. And then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, just inshallah vibes, right? And she was also talking about how maybe young ladies will say, oh, I'm a Jesus body and all of that. And that there's nothing like that. That for us as a believer, our, as believers, our deeds and our actions should match the gospel or this word that we are preaching. Now, we're not, we're not just saying something that has not happened in us or that has not transformed us or that has not changed us. So it calls for an action point for us, right, that it's beautiful that we get to share this gospel, but we should also, it should work in our own lives too, that people can see that we have honored this word, we have revered this gospel, it has transformed us, and the people listening to us can also have the same effect. So as beautiful as it is to pray that the Holy Spirit um, turns the hearts of men and women that we evangelize to, that we preach to, it's also important that we ourselves honor and revere um, this gospel. And that's one of the things that Paul was asking the believers to pray for him there, that the word of God will spread quickly and that it be honored and accepted uh, amongst, amongst them. So uh, let's go to verse 2. Verse 2 says, And that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men. For not all have faith. That's another part of the prayer that Paul is asking um, the Thessalonian church to pray for. So I, I have a question here. Is there a way that the ministers of the gospel, can we have 
the microphone. Is there a way that the ministers of the gospel can actually know this wicked and evil men? You know, we've talked about how, you know, severally somebody will just maybe stand up um, for the sake of just setting a minister of the gospel up and just do something corny, right? Maybe you just want to bring down this person's ministry. And you can come like any other person. You know the call is to preach, to evangelize to people outside, right? Not You shouldn't select anybody. So is there a way that we can, in generalizing our missions to everybody, we're able to identify or see wicked and evil men that are just uh, pretending like, oh, they want to be uh, preached to, but rather they have an ulterior motive at the back of their mind. Is there a way that ministers of the gospel can actually know that, oh, okay, this particular person is an evil person, doesn't have faith, and oh, this person has faith. So I want to hear our inputs. Well, not many, everybody can just talk now, so what do we think? Is there a way that you can actually know that, oh, okay, this person? Okay. Praise God. Amen. Um, I think the only way a person can know is if the Spirit of God directs him to know. And that's true prayer. It's the Holy Spirit that gives us the spirit of discernment. So it is true discernment that we can be able to, to know truly those people who are um, called or chosen and those who are just pretending. Okay. Okay. Okay, there is the mic is. <laughs> So the verse says, for not all have faith. So we can look at them and see if they have faith. And we usually say um, that we can look at their attitude towards um, the brethren, their attitude towards sin, and their attitude towards God to see if you know their faith is genuine. So we can look at that also. Information. So, do we consider such a person as a one who is um, a wicked and unreasonable person? No, because, um, like I said, the verse says, "For not all men have faith." So, um, the person that is growing, you will see. You should be able to see certain signs. For instance, the person um, the person can desire the word of God even though he is struggling with something. So you will see some of those like you shall see evidence of grace in the person's life. But for these guys, this wicked I don't know, you will you and then like like Zomo said, um Discernment from the Holy Spirit. If you join, you know, these tests and discernments and some other things. But I'm just pointing what the verse says that they don't have faith. Okay, um, Pastor Martin. Pastor Martin. Uh, okay. In addition to what it says, uh, they are teaching too. You can know whether the person have faith or not. Some they will crash at the end of the day because they are not faithful with the work that God has given them. So one of it is that through <coughs> their teaching that they teach people, because some of them do to their own selfish interest. So they do not refer God, rather they only depend on their self. Okay. Okay, in, okay, go ahead. Okay. In addition to that, I, I want to ask it this way. Those that stand against the teaching of the word of God, which is, the Bible says, faith come by hearing and hearing from the word of God. So anyone that we stand against the teaching of the true word of God. Okay. Tessan, you want to say something? Yeah, Dada. Uh, 
So another way that we can know that he is an evil person is his attitude to sin, his attitude to God, and his attitude to the brethren. Secondly, by what he obeys, what he loves, and what he believes. That's a very solid point. All right. Um, I want to add up to what Tizan said and then what Dario said by what they desire and what they love. And then this, this side of the Bible talks about Simon the sorcerer. When he heard the word of God, he actually, should I say, he just joined them. And then when he saw Paul preaching, he wanted to like buy it. So initially, should I say, is he partially believing? Because at the end, he wanted to buy it, and then Paul cost him that, may you perish with your money. So I believe one of the things you know is their love towards God, especially the word of God, and then their desire towards it. So that's what I... And, and maybe again, I will have wished that we define what we mean by wicked and unreasonable men. So do we have a working definition for that? What do we mean by wicked and unreasonable men? Because okay. that seems a bit broad to me. Because uh, while you're t talking, I'm thinking of situations where some people such seemingly meet these categorizations. Uh, however, at the end of it, you see that these are some of the most heartless people. And they were believers. Some of them were in church boards. Uh, a good example is, um, as much as I don't like to mention names, but let me mention two. A good example is uh, with the Rabbi Zacharias' ministry. Uh, you know, people just going and taking down every message he has preached. I mean, I mean, I can't imagine the level of wickedness that you are trying to wipe out a man's ministerial legacy because of a presumed personal shortfall in his personal life. All right? Okay, so let's assume that the man had a shortfall in his life, a sin in his life. But what about what the man has taught? Does it negate it as truth? So it seems like that was just a, a hatred for the man's impact. And they took down every message, articles, like everything that had to do with and they took it down. For me, there is no definition of a wicked and unreasonable person worse than that. But these were people that were serving on RZIM board. These are people that I've heard Ravi speak about them with so much you need to hear him speak about his board with so much warmth and love. Like the warmth, the love that he speaks about them. A second example is what we are seeing happening now with, uh, uh, with Steve Lawson. You know, the kind of people that are coming out to speak against him. Some of them are people that were, I mean, were ministering alongside with him, have sat down on podiums and pulpits with him to preach. And for some of them are platforms that he has gone to preach for. You know, one of his hardest critics is from Grace Community Church. Uh, somebody asked the question that, can we still, what about people that have bought losses materials? Can they still use it? And somebody just arrogantly already said that, look, he doesn't think that anybody should ever use his materials again. I mean, this is over 40 years of faithful and consistent ministry, and uh, that's another area where I sort of disagree with Mark 10. You know, because if you say that, oh, at the end of his life he crashes, does that, does that make the person a wicked person? You know, that, that is a room for, for, for sanctification, progressive sanctification for him. I don't think that that disqualifies him. But point I'm making is there are people that could have been or are showing a desire for the word of God. You know, while any of these guys were teaching, they were there, they were sitting down, they were giving offerings, they were going for mission trips with them, they were responding to the means of grace, seemingly, but suddenly when they had an opportunity, they just hacked down everything about this man. Uh, you can't call five expositors of our generation and not cause Steve Lawson. It's impossible. Like, it is absolutely impossible. He's one of the most foremost Bible expositors in this day and time. And yet somebody is saying, look, take down everything he has done. Don't buy his books again. 
just imagine, let's say maybe something happens to Victor, and let's say Vinci or Dr. Livingston that you expect to be, or Danju, people that expect there should be is ministerial support to him. Are the first people to say every message that Victor has preached, take it down. Every book he has written, we consider it, I mean, so, so while we are talking, those are the things that are playing in my mind, right? That what about people like this that show a high sense of animosity? Do we consider that evil and unreasonable men? Or what, do we have a working definition for that? So just, just to add up to clarifying on the question. Okay, before we open the floor, uh, we also see, uh, you know, we said um, part of the thing Tizan said and um, Dada said, you said their attitude to God, attitude to sin, and attitude to the brethren. We see a flaw there with their attitude to the brethren this kind of men, right? That the love that we, ex that we expect, that they express to the brotherhood, to the church, um, is now anonym anonymity, rather. So we see that there's also, that there's a question mark there, so there's a problem. So we can actually, uh, looking at that definition, we can actually say that, oh, okay, these people are actually being um, wicked and unreasonable. Because maybe their attitude to sin is top notch, they have a score for that, but how are they relating with the brethren, especially in the wake of something bad happening to the brethren? We see an issue there. So, but let's, let's talk more um, on that. So we're talking about, um, the question I initially asked was, is there a way that ministers of the gospel can identify wicked and unreasonable men? Right, so that's what we're talking around. And people are saying, oh, okay, maybe based on their love, based on their taste, based on their work, based on their attitude to God, based on their attitude to sin, and based on their um, attitude to the brethren. So is there, um, like Pastor said now, that we see, okay, maybe that their work seems good, uh, their taste seems good, they seem to be in the same circle, but can they still have, can they still be wicked and unreasonable men, even after they've ticked some of those other boxes? Okay. Uh, Pastor, okay, sorry, sorry, Martin. So I'm just thinking about, and I like the fact that we're using a concrete example because so we are not speaking and in, in, right. in abstract. Uh -huh. um, I'm just trying to think if it's, if, for example, let's, let me use the Steve Lawson example. I'm just trying to think if it's, or let me use Rabbi, Rabbi, Rabbi Zacharias' example. I don't think when Rabbi Zacharias was talking nice about his team, I don't think he was faking it. Honestly, I believe he was he was sincere, right? I believe he was sincere. So about this wicked and unreasonable man, it 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 honestly it might be difficult, eh? Apart from just apart from the sermon that the Spirit of God gives, it might be difficult to spot them. And that makes sense because of the prayer that Paul is praying that God should deliver him from them. I don't know them. God shall deliver me from them. It might be, oh, when I be a faru, swinging out the church, God has delivered me from those kind of people. You get what I'm saying? So it might be a little bit difficult to 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 spot those kind of people. You get what I'm saying? But some other people, God will just by His mercy and His own prerogative, He's going to show you the person by His character, even while the person is around. You get what I'm saying? Uh -huh. So just know that in any case, God shall deliver me from such people, whether by showing me the person. You know, like, like Jesus would say, I mean, like the Bible would say, that Jesus refused, refused to commit himself to people because he knew what was in their heart. However, um, in our own case, we might not know, we might not know what, what is in their heart, but in, 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 in either case, whether, we, whether God will show us um, by his mercy and his prerogative, show us what is in their heart, and then we'll just keep them at, at, at arm's length, number one. Or secondly, God's going to deliver us from them after they leave. You get what I'm saying? Uh -huh. But at the same, I have a question too about that. Okay. Um, but before I ask the question, I, I wanted to see the attitude towards sin is not good too. You know, you said the attitude towards the brethren is bad. Right. But the attitude towards sin is, no, it's not good. The attitude towards sin is not good. Because that's not the right attitude towards sin. You know, jo um, uh, I mean, Paul, Paul, Paul mentioned, even in Thessalonians, that treat the brother, treat have nothing to do with him. 
but treat him as a brother still, not as an enemy. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? So their attitude towards the brethren is bad. Their attitude towards sin is also bad. You get what I'm saying, but yeah. but in, in that light, I, have, I still have a question mm-hmm. because it seems to me that we are showing grace to the to the fallen minister. How about to the people that the people that are treating the minister the wrong way? How can we show them? How can we show them um, grace as well? To the wicked and unreasonable yes. men, okay. especially in the case of um, Steve Lawson. Some of the people that are speaking against him are pastors, are great expositors too. How can we show them grace? Because if you look at the reason why they are giving. Of course, it's their reason is terrible, it's bad, it's, it's unbiblical. Yeah, but they are ministers. So how can we how can we extend the same grace that we extend that we are extending to Steve Lawson to them? Because they are ministers too, they are doing God's work too. They are still in ministry. Yeah. Sorry, let me let me say something again. Because if you if, during if you remember during um Rabbi Zacharias um issue, one of the people that spoke against him was John MacArthur. John MacArthur says that guy is in hell. That guy is in hell. John MacArthur is like the, it's like the pastor Chris of reform people right now. But he said that um, Rabbi Zacharias is in hell. So how can we extend the same grace that we are extending to Rabbi Zacharias to, to to to, to Johnny Mark? <laughs> that's that's my question. Yeah. The question is not for me. It's for all of us. So. So the pas- the mic is it pastor. Okay, somebody's okay, you please. You know, that's to to the to response to Pastor's question, Pastor Victor. Some of the challenges that we subject ourselves to the word of God in some things. And some things we think we have opinions and our feelings matter. And we do the same thing when we call crowd um uh, what do they call it? Is it crowd judgment or something? No crowd justice. Now, what is happening now to Steve Lawson? We need to subject, as far as the Bible expositor, subject to opinion to the word of God. Even the issue of rabbis of Christ, have you subjected yourself to the word of God? Funny enough, in the Bible, we have catalog of people that started well but ended badly. A lot of them in the Bible ended badly, especially in the Old Testament. You see um, kings like Asa, people like Solomon, Rehoboam, many of them ended well. Yet, they are in the good books, and their books are in the Bible, and we study them. In fact, grace was, even their Abraham, grace was ministered to them. So, on what basis do they come to see that Rabbi Zacharias in hell? Are you now counteracting um, the grace of God's salvation? On what basis? It's just your opinion. If you are feeling bad about the person, deal with it personally. That's your feeling. That's not the word of God. And as a pastor, when you are coming to talk like that, you should project the opinions of God. Even when that thing happened to Rabbi Zacharias, that's my problem with my culture. And I think John Piper, there were two of them. I was disappointed. As most as your guy for the for the brother, we say just keep quiet about it. Yeah. All right. Then now you are pulling down his material. Does that now negate the truth? I, I, there was a time I posted on Facebook, uh, Twitter about Rabbi Zacharias from nowhere. Somebody posted that. Did I know he's this this? Um, come and see insult. I said I know, but that doesn't reduce what he preached. You are getting the point. And the same is happening to. I know, and funny enough is, I don't know why pastors feel they need to comment on these kind of issues. It happened within the church. Deal with it within the church. Not something you can say publicly and nobody's even asking you for your opinion. You just come publicly and start talking about... There's nothing to just say our brother is going through a time and we are helping him to... And which origin? Since the church has done the church discipline, you must not comment. And funny to me, you are not commenting, you are not subjecting yourself to the word of God. You are giving your opinion. And when we start giving our opinion, when should we really stop? That's not the issue. So I think that should be very, very important. And to the fact that um, whether we will know this man, we might not know them. But one thing that we should be sincere, and we can see the case of Rabbi Zacharias. Ah, Rabbi Zacharias is like Paul. He knows how to heal people. He talks about his team, if, especially when he travels with a person. You know? But he was being sincere all his life. And that's the best we can do. Whatever they do, that's their own personal problem. You know? and, it, and as he said, from the words, they say wicked and unreasonable men. It doesn't make sense, the issue of uh, Ravi. Funny enough, it is us that have forgiveness, yet we don't behave like that. Which person writing a book, maybe you are a, in fact, there have been cases like that. Somebody is, is, a, is a psychologist that deals with rapists or children or pedophile, and he commits that crime. Do you see they remove his books about pedophile, this, you no know, rape? No. 
He still sells on what basis our unbelievers leaving his book there. But us, we have the justification to live life as a Christ material, but we are not doing it. You should put down his material. Is it not the gospel? So, yeah, actually, as the Bible said, they are unreasonable. It doesn't make sense. All their point doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Anybody else wants to? You know, going by, by that judgment like he made, in fact, it sounds like uh, Johnny Mark is a wicked and unreasonable one. <laughs> and, and that will inevitably mean that he doesn't have faith. If I'm going to add to the, by Darius's argument. Yeah, he doesn't have faith. And that will mean that if he doesn't have faith, he's also going to hell. So if you do one plus one plus one. But actually, that's not it. So, and that's why I believe that Johnny Mark's uh, I totally disagreed with him when he said that. I felt that was too arrogant. Um, and so, which is typical, and that's, that's the reason that I have refused to agree with the tag reformed. You get? Like, I'm, no, I'm not reformed. I'm a biblical Christian. Our chapel here is a biblical chapel. We are not a reformed chapel. You know, and because of the scarcity of reformed guys, the ones they see anybody that is doing expositions, is sticky. They just want to adopt the person and say, oh, this is one of us. No, I'm not one of you. I'm a Christian. I'm, I'm, I'm one for the Christians. You know, before we did the APC, I remember I had a meeting with when they came to do, to, I mean, to ask us if we could host. And so one of the questions, you know, Pastor Abu to asked me was like, so what, are, what do I think? Where do I think that we have doctrinal differences? Oh, I clearly I told him, I said, first of all, most of you reformed guys are cessationist. I am not a cessationist. We are continuationist here. If you come to this chapel, we pray in tongues. That was the first thing I said. We are not cessationist here. We believe that the power of God is still at work till today. We believe that mighty miracles are operational. We believe that the giftings of God are operational to this day. We don't believe that they have ceased. So, of course, as much as we, we are regulative in worship and we encourage people to speak in tongues in a regulative way, if, if somebody's praying in tongues, I'm not going to stop him. And, you know, one of the guys that came, like uh, Pastor Barnabas Solari, whom I like so much, he, he, he was a Pentecostal for maybe 20-something years. And he has spoken in tongues for like 20-something years. You know, because when I took him out for dinner, uh, me, Pastor Olari, and uh, Pastor Bolaji, and Badadi Jabal, but we started talking a bit around doctrine, and then he said, look, I, I mean, being in the Pentecostal cycle for this long, I mean, you can't come up and tell me that I was... I was hallucinating when I was speaking in tongues. Speaking in, like, so when the reform guy says speaking in tongues, no, I don't agree with you, you know, because I've spoken in tongues for 28 years. I've been in Pentecostal circle for 28 years. So, but I can say, look, these are our doctrinal differences. You know, when, when this Lawson thing happened, I said to one of the guys that is that likes attacking people, and I said, isn't it amazing that you are calling for grace for Lawson? I said, but if it was any of those Pentecostal guys, any of those apostle guys that you hate, would you extend the same level of grace? You wouldn't. But now because it's somebody that is in your cycle, you are, you are trying to say, oh, God has granted loss and repentance. But if it was an apostle, somebody, you would say, that man we have been telling you, these guys are heretics. Another thing is that, I, and, and this, this is my opinion, right? I think that this was another way of God humbling even people in that cycle. Because the, the, the present brother in question is also somebody that has spoken harshly against Pentecostals, against uh, even people like Ravi. That's uh, Pastor Steve. I mean, he's spoken about there are people that have made a mockery on panels. You know, when they say that they make a mockery. I remember one time they asked them... Uh, Somebody in the, in, the, in, the, in the congregation asked them, what do you think about speaking in tongues? And then one of them just, just did a mimicry. Say, say, this is what I make of it. Nonsense. Like literally, like this nonsense. And, and the question the person asked was an honest question. Please help me make sense. Because I'm looking at it in 1 Corinthians 14. Is this something that we, look, I could feel the honesty in the person's question? And he just made a mockery of the question. Just laughed and just said, look, this gibberish nonsense that doesn't make sense. That's how this doesn't make sense. It's gibberish nonsense. 
and they moved on to the next question. And on that panel, they had the cream de la cream of that crop. You had them Sinclair Ferguson, you had them Steve Lawson, you had them John Marcato, you had, I mean, the cream de la cream, I think Alistair Berg was there too, like they were all seated there. But this happened to sort of just give some form of humility. Let him that thinks he stands, take heed lest he falls. Let no man think of himself more highly than he ought to. But let him put some form of estimation to himself. So, responding to Victor's question, how do we deal even with these people? You know, and I would, I would take my cue from a comment I made to a brother, which is, it's unfortunate that part of our, part of the, part of the things that the reform cycle is known for is the teaching of grace. I said, isn't it amazing that the reform cycle teaches grace the most, yet they are the least gracious people. You teach grace the most. In fact, you have one of your, the, the five solas, a sola gratia. Yet you are the least gracious people. Look at how, if you look at your dealings with, for example, Steve Lawson, do you think that that's a gracious dealing? If you look at your dealings with, with Ravi Zacharias, do you think that that's a gracious dealing? In fact, let me add, some people came up to, as far as say, I say that, you know, he has been disqualified from public ministry. I said the arrogance. You know, when I, when I, when I heard that, but I went back and I read Timothy's pastoral letter and Titus' pastoral letter. Wallahi. If we are going to follow the qualifications for being a pastor or a deacon, there is nobody that will stand on this pulpit. Do you know that he says one of the qualifications you must be you must have raised your children well how many pastors kids do we know that are deviants does that alone has disqualified many pastors because that is a, that is a classification more than the issue of oh infidelity or immorality you know he please let's read it all right Look at, look at Titus 1. Give us on the screen as loud. From verse 6. anyone is above reproach. That's, above reproach means that nobody has, can ever point a finger at you. The husband of one wife or a one woman man. Alright? Because if you are going to follow this in detail, if you are going to follow this in detail, then a lot of men who are single cannot be elders. If you are going to follow these verses in detail, if you are not married, you cannot be an elder. Because categorically he says, some people will say, oh, this means a one-woman man. One-woman man that is that, in other words, you can have a girlfriend and it is your only girlfriend. But no, he says, and his children are believers. So he actually, Paul actually qualifies what it means by an elder. It must be somebody who is married with children. And his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. His children must be believers. His children have no, no accusation of misbehavior or stubbornness. Move on. For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain. Add another, add the next verse. But hospitable, a lover of God, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. How many of us fit this bill completely? Now, give us the first, first Timothy 3, right? Let me read verse 1 to about 6, 7. 
The, the saying is trustworthy. If anyone has passed the office of an overseer, that's talking about the office of a pastor, right? He desires a noble task. Move on. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, that's clear-headed, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable. That means he has an open heart, has an open arm, able to teach. How many pastors do we have that stand on the pulpit? You don't understand what they are saying. Oh. And a lot of you go to church and you say, what did I even learn here? Part of the qualification, the person must be able to teach. Move on. He says, move on, Isla. Not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. Which of us here from apostle to which of us here doesn't love money? Gimbia, you don't love money, ba? Good. Move on. Look at verse 4. He must manage his household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. Move on. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for, the, for God's church? This qualifies John Piper from being a pastor. Because he has a son who is a deviant, who is an atheist. We should take, every, by that principle that we apply to Lawson, we should take every single message Piper has preached, every book Piper has preached off the shelf, because he has failed in ministry. The point I'm making simply is this. We, we, you know, it's like the, the principle in some of our churches that you pick and choose which part you want to apply forgetting that in that same portion of scripture first of all forget about the fact that you may wrongly misinterpreted that text but that portion of scripture the verses before then said if you have a son who is stubborn let's bring him to the public let them stone him to death we left that verse just side by side and jumped to the one that says a woman shall not hear whether which pertains to a man look at the hypocrisy in our biblical reading what am I saying in a nutshell the standards by which we are judging, we judge people. How many of us can beat our chest and stand? And look, as, as, I, as I look at this, as we look at this, this should make us more gracious to fallen ministers and say, look, if, if they are going to put me on the same pedestal as you, I will, I will, I will have fallen worse than you have done. So this, some of these guys are weep, and I'm applying it to us. We must not be people that preach grace and be the least gracious people. In fact, in the light of this Lawson's thing, the, the, some of the pastors are here. We, we did a pastoral meeting. We took an entire day to fast and we met in the evening to pray for him. And we said, as a house, as light work, as this chapel, how would we deal if we hear a team leader, a pastor, if we hear anybody in any of this, how are we going to deal with this? Because I just realized we didn't have a clear cutting. And we arrived at a, at a resolution. This is how we must deal with it. From scripture, we must be gracious. So both, both the people that are the minister who is grieving and the people who are, you know, the, the, the people attacking the minister, we must maintain a stance of graciousness to them. Of course, being gracious to them doesn't necessarily mean that we must be partakers of their own sins, right? But it means that we should create a room for healing and which is the purpose of church discipline I, I don't know if you get what I'm saying right okay. okay when you ask uh, the how can we detect uh, those uh, people that does not have faith in God so uh, when I say so uh, they will crash, that means they will not succeed. So I don't know which pastor say he disagree, right? So does that mean that people that are unbelief, are they going to succeed? Or how I didn't understand. I don't know whether I can have clarity on that. People that could be false teachers, people that could be crooks, and, and they are by, by human ministerial standards they are succeeding. Again, I don't want to mention names because I, <laughs> since we are recording and people listen to it, 
afterwards we can crack inside jokes here and I just realized that people could be listening and not understand what we're talking about. You know, I've been listening to the light work messages, all of them. I've started following one by one. I'm still in First Thessalonians, almost finishing, but I've been listening to all the light work messages. So I just realized that sometimes we, we make a joke, but if somebody is listening as a second party, he will miss it because it's an inside joke, right? So, but point I'm making is this, right? There are people, there are many examples that I could mention, all right? There are a lot of people like that. There are a lot of false teachers, false prophets all over the world that by human ministerial judgment, they succeed. They have a large following. Uh, the other day I showed, I showed an example here using YouTube. Right? I put a, a, a sound biblical teacher of God's word and I put one of our modern day apostles and I said, okay, look at the views that they had. I said, look at the title of their messages. The guy that was preaching a Christocentric message didn't have up to 50,000 views. The guy that was teaching them dust was having 3.5 million views. What, and he succeeded, both in terms of number and in terms of making money <laughs> online. And in terms of people that are coming to sow seed because they want things to move. I, you get what I'm saying? So in those human, by those human definitions, such people will succeed. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. There are a lot of fake prophets, false prophets that will make some form of headway by human classification. Our job is to teach the right word of God. Whether it contradicts our life or not. At the end of the day, our lives should be submitted to the word of God. I don't know if that helps in any way. But if you have a follow-up question, you can ask. Yeah. They will succeed. But with their journey with God, they will not succeed. All right. Any questions? Or? All right. Uh, so let's tie it up. Um, verse 3 says, But the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. And that's where we're driving at. So whether it is we know these evil and wicked unreasonable men or whether we do not know them, the point is that um, God is faithful. He's the one that keeps us and he's the one that preserves us. In our own wisdom or in our own thinking, we might think, oh, okay, if I do one, two, three, four, five, six things, then I will be secured, like I will be safe, right? All of these things will not come to me. But it is God that keeps and preserves us. We can have like a very beautiful blueprint on how to, you know, avoid this man, avoid controversies, avoid all of these things. But if God does not keep us or if he does not preserve us, then we can easily fall prey. So that's the point today, that it is God that is faithful. He's the one that keeps and preserves us. And as we pray for his preservation, we must have a listening ear to his leading. Right? God shouldn't be telling you that there's a problem here or with this particular person, but you just you trust yourself. Maybe you've dealt with an issue like that before and you came out flying. So you just know if it's this particular issue, I have dealt with it. It's not a problem for me. We must um, be willing, as we are praying and asking God for deliverance, we must be willing to also listen to his leading when it comes to those men. He will give us wisdom how to go around maybe traps and things like that, but we must also have a heart that listens and is willing to um, obey what God is asking us to do part time so verse 4 says and we have confidence in the Lord about you that you are doing and will do the things that we command um, of course anytime I read this verse is a very comfort comforting part of scripture for me that the reason why um, I will continue in the faith and be strong is because of my confidence in the one who has called me who is God Right? It's not in my um, past successes or how much progress I think I have made, that the reason why I can be at peace or why I can be comforted is because my confidence should be in God. And it's a reminder to us this morning that we should always remove our eyes. There are many things that can make you um, put your confidence in them, right? Past experiences, past successes. 
but you must continually remind yourself that your confidence should be in God. And as that um, comforts you, that should strengthen your faith. That should make you um, not afraid to step out in faith because you know where, who is keeping you or who is holding you, right? Uh, anytime we put ourselves into the equation, there's always question mark, how am I sure, how am I sure, how am I sure? How am I sure 10 years from now? How am I sure five years from now? How am I even sure two minutes from now? I'll do the right thing. But if we continually remind ourselves that our confidence is in God, we're able to enjoy our walk and our journey with God because all our faith and our hope is in him. And he's able to keep us and he's able to preserve us. So verse 5 says, um, May the Lord direct your heart to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. And I have another question here. Are there markers in our lives as believers that we can look at or point at that actually shows that this prayer is being answered? Do you understand the question? This prayer says, this is a prayer that Paul is praying for the Thessalonian church. It says, may the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. So are there pointers in our lives that we can look at and say, oh, okay, this prayer is being answered in my own life. So I want us to talk about that. You understand the question, right? Okay. Mark 10. Uh, I just want to give a brief for uh, my life too. Uh, because when we are on the street, when we sit down with my friends, I normally tell them that actually this life that I'm living, I don't like the way I'm living. I really want to stop smoking and drinking. So, and I was sincere in my heart, I really want to leave it. So, uh, one day when Pastor came for evangelism in our area, so that was the time that I started seeing this is the time for me to just leave the street. And so coming to Light Talks has really helped me. I've seen it as if it's an answer prayer because I've been praying for that. I really need to change this. I really want, I don't want to smoke. So even sometimes if I have opportunity and I go out and meet my friends, they will say, ah, I will send this to them, like play, like play. Now I've left them. So I think it's an answer prayer to me. Mm -hmm. Your desire has changed, right? Okay. Anybody else wants to say something? Okay, just to add to what Mark Ten has said, um, I see myself loving God more. And usually I church was not really my thing. I, I was not a person that would want to be around people because I was scared of being judged. I was scared of a lot of things. But right now, I'm proud to tell people my story. I'm proud to share the word of God, that it's normal for me right now. And sometimes I feel, when I hear people saying some, some things that was normal for me to hear and be comfortable, I'm like, God, please, just help me not to take this thing, to be able to just avoid this kind of conversations. It was something that I didn't, um, I wasn't, comf I was comfortable with it before. But right now, I see myself staying focused in the things of God and being practi practical about the things of God. Before, it was just wishes. I used to wish I can do this. I used to wish I, would, I can go out and evangelize. But right now, I see myself being more proactive instead of making those wishes. And this is an answered prayer for me. Anyone Praise God. Else? Yes. So for me, a lot of things, but then let me pick. I am more like, I love party because I love dancing. So at some point, when I started coming closer to God, so there was this way, I cannot, I might, you might invite me for your wedding, no, I will not come, but that night after party, I'll be, <laughs> I'll be there. <laughs> very, very. <laughs> I will be there. And my friends, if they are going, I, I give them life of the past. So you hear everybody calling, give me where are you? So the last time I did that, I actually attended the wedding. So everybody was like, ah, ah, kina kaduna on chamarando. So to my greater surprise, I attended a wedding and I only met five to ten people that I knew, like 
after us like wow really in this KD like this so they said I must come for the after party when I went there eh, the way I sat down back I was just feeling what am I doing here what exactly are you doing here Gimo? and before they know it um, I just told them me it, some of them I didn't even tell I was going I just quietly moved out and, and that was the last time I think I attended any after party or something like that so it's indeed an uh, answer prayer for me. See, Pastor Simak. So, so I I feel that um, there's this uh, insatiable uh, hunger in man that uh, only God can fill, right? So. Growing up, you, you find that people sometimes are misguided, right? They don't have the right background or sometimes peer pressure and all of that. People go down paths they are not supposed to, right? But then somehow, somehow, God's grace finds them, right? And then they're able to re retrace their steps back to, to God, right? And then if you're able to really get to that place where God is really God in your life, right? I, I, you just find out that whatever it is you are looking for in the widow, in the sex, or in the whatever, in the streets, and all of that, you find out that 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 uh, uh, sorry for the use of that word. Yes. Yeah, so, so at the end of the day, you find out that 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 void, that uh, hunger, can only be satisfied in God, right? And then when you are able to really get to that place, you find out that yeah, God is God, and He is good. Anyone else? Um, like we've all been saying, um, there are certain markers that we can see in our lives and know that the love of God in our lives is increasing, right? From the things we used to enjoy doing, the things that used to get our attention, our attitude towards the things of God. Like we've said several in this house, that you cannot say you love God and hate fellowship or hate the brethren, right? So there are markers that we can check from time to time and know that, oh, okay, this is actually, um, the love of God in my life is actually increasing. And it's important that we do this. Because sometimes we just pray a general prayer. And we just say it like from our mouth. We don't mean it in our hearts. But if you know that um, these prayers, God hears our prayers. He answers our prayers. And there are marks that we can see. That encourages us to, to pray more, to, to love him more. Because we are able to see that, oh, okay, I was here before, but I'm here. And it's not because of anything that I've done. It's because God has helped me. So it's because God has answered my prayers. So um, it's a very beautiful prayer that Paul prayed. Uh, and the lesson point is that um, God answers these prayers. And we can actually evidently see that these prayers are being answered in our lives. So um, verse 6 says, Now we command you, brothers, in the name of the Lord Jesus, so that you keep away from any brother who is working in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you received from us. And first here we see that this is a command. So it's not just Paul's opinion. And he said it's a command in the name of the Lord. So it's not just Paul commanding them. The backing behind his command is the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's not something we can negotiate. It's not something we can play around with and say this is a man's opinion. This is an instruction, a command from God. And we must see it as such. Right? Um, a command is not something negotiable. It's not something that you can pick and choose whether you want to do it or not. It's a command and it's from the Lord. And, it's so, and that's how we should see it. Um, that we should keep away from any brother who is working in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you received from us. And we talked about what it means to keep away, right? Not forming close um, bonds of um, friendship. And the most important thing that we keep saying why we should keep away is not just because we want to become enemies with these people or punish them or make them look bad. It's a point of correction that they miss out on the love and comfort that comes with fellowshipping with other brethren and they, they pick up and do what they are supposed to do um, so uh, I, I want to also ask here um, is the church still a place of love and comfort and fellowship that if we are able to that if we put somebody aside they will desire to want to come back to that love and comfort and fellowship because that's what um um, discipline in the church is right that 
this is a place where you are nourished, where you flourish, where you gain Ghana strength and all of that. And all of a sudden, you are told to, okay, just step aside small. And you should feel bad because now you don't have any place where you can get all of those things. Is the church still that um, kind of place, even like today? That if you put somebody aside, they will actually miss the bond of love, fellowship, and comfort and will desire to want to go back in. What do we think? A place of love, comfort, and fellowship. So much so that if we are asking somebody to step aside from that, they will miss that and desire to want to go back in. In some extent, yes, but I think the major challenge to church discipline now, there are two major challenges. One, the administration of it. Two, the proliferation of churches. Those are the two challenges. Uh, proliferation of churches in the sense that, no, number three, uh, the, the pressure to treat goats as sheep. Uh, when, when somebody is not born again, you shouldn't even put him under church discipline because he's not born again. He's a goat. Uh, church discipline is for the sheep. People that are believers know that they are believers, have accepted that they are under Christ. And so we must be able to separate between the goat and the sheep. And one of the things I'm trying to make peace with in these days is do not pastor people that don't want to be pastored. If I had to remind myself of that, I think on Monday, do not try to pastor people that don't want to be pastored. Because you're going to waste a lot of energy and resources. Right? Uh, the energy you're supposed to put on people that want to be pastored, you'll be putting it on the wrong people. And uh, this is a good place I've come to in my mind. Now, part of what that means is this. Uh, if somebody is a goat and he does something wrong, and you call him to order, he feels like you are judging him. He will not come under God's word and say, oh, this is God's word judging me. He will feel like the church is judgmental. You know, why are you judging me? And if you take the next step and say, look, you know what? We're going to put you under church discipline. The next thing he's going to do is, he's going have a big deal. He'll stand up and go to another church. And he'll go and even say terrible things about you. For example, we had a brother here that was in a very terrible form of life. If what he does is he would go around asking people for money. At one point, he was even using Lightworks name to collect money from people. You know, he would say, oh, we have this project coming. Let's say maybe we have medical outreach coming. You know, you can donate through us, through me. And people would send him money. He would send one text message to me, to Victor, to Dr. Livingston. He would send it to a lot of people. That, oh, his mother is sick, she's about to die. You know, please, he just, and he will tell you an amount that you can easily afford. You get. He said, please, if you can just help me with 3,000 or 5,000. So by the time he collects 3,000 from Victor, from me, from Dr. Livingston, from Dr. Fage, from Gimo, from Danju, he collects from uh, 20 people. He has collected 60K that money. You know, someone we discover what he was doing. We, we, I think it was Daddy Jabal or so that was supposed to talk with him. And we, we tried to make this brother to work. You know, I mean, we went out of our way. The moment we called him to order, he just packed his things and left. Never came back. But when Victor tried to follow up the brother, it was as though it was as though he was even doing the Victor a favor. Now Victor was like, ah oh, man, we've not seen you in a while. Like, I mean, try, please try and make it to church. He was not telling Victor, you know, I would think about it. Like, what did he say? You know, you see if he's free or something. You know, when he has time, he will try and check and see what's happening. Stuff like that. Now that brother could have easily moved to another place gone and is replicating the same wickedness and you may think that and it depends on what he wants to say there you know about this place so that's one but the other side again like I said the administration of the church discipline church discipline should be restorative it's not to exile the person a lot of our churches put people under church and, and we've had a case here uh, where we had a sister that went out of line totally out of line and we, we, we assigned her to another sister to kind of follow her up. And that older sister didn't do that. That wasn't the fault of the younger girl. 
right? So if, 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 for example, somebody goes out of line and we assign Victor to him, we say, Victor, okay, follow him up, check up on him to ensure that he's restored. And Victor is very busy every day. That's a problem from Victor. That's a problem from us. That we didn't follow up on the brother. We didn't, oh, how are you? We didn't set up meetings with him. We didn't call him to come. We didn't hold him accountable. So many times, church discipline could be administered that way. And instead of restoring the brother, the brother is left in isolation and he just sinks in. I, 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 uh -huh. Thirdly, lastly, again, there are people that even though you are doing that, they just, they want to take advantage of that and continue repeating a pattern. Paul tells us what to do in that case. He says, after a first and a second admonition, such a one put away from you. Don't, 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 don't continue. In fact, if you have to put him out of the church, put him out of the church. Because he's going to end up corrupting everybody. So three things. One, the issue of poor administration. Two, the issue of uh, proliferation of churches. Three, the issue of uh, taking decisive, ju decisive judgment on whether to put out the person uh, or, or keep the person. So those are the things that makes this is where we are now when it comes to the issue of church discipline and church uh, administration. Even though, even though Pastor mentioned it um, a little bit, but these days church is, is like it's like brand competing against brand. You get so if if someone leaves that church and comes to my church, I don't care. I've got seen a new member. I remember when I was in when I was in Abu's area, there's a brother that was living with a lady that was his girlfriend that they, of course they were not married they, they were just in a relationship they were living together and they called him the church the church he was in that time i mean he was the guy could sing very very well they called him they spoke to him he was active in the church music team or whatever they called the uh, it was called that time they called him they spoke to him the the guy refused then i remember that day i was in i was in that church i, I, I mean i wasn't a member of the church, but that day I was in church when they called him out, and he was in church that day. I remember the pastor went up and said, we, di we did this. I mean, the pastor gave all the team they tried, all the team they tried to do to correct the brother. And then the pastor said, because of this, he's uh, 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 excommunicated. He's no longer active in this church. He's not a member of this church. I know what the brother did. He went to another ministry, and they accepted, accepted him with open arms. You get what I'm saying? And as far as they are concerned, yeah, as far as they were concerned, they've gotten a new music, very, very solid. I mean, the guy could sing very well. You get what I'm saying? When I was small, ba, when I was small, I can remember, I remember this thing very, very clearly. Every time, you know how we would say, yeah, yeah, new time, new first timers, raise up your hand. Every time there was a first timer, and the, and the first timer says, I'm coming to join. I remember our pastor that time would say, me, when they go in the church, he me afaru. Um, did you try, did you move? What happened? I hope you are not you are not on that church discipline from the other church. I, I mean, very very conservative church. But in this day and time, nothing concerns us. The moment the church leaves, the moment someone leaves the church and comes to our church, we don't care what why he. You don't. I mean, as far as we are concerned, we've got some another tight tight pay member. So that's another reason why that church discipline. Honestly, in this day and time, the dynamics is a little bit. It's difficult to admin, administer. Okay, anybody wants to add question, comment? All right, um, verse 7 says, For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we are not idle when we were with you. Nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with toil and labor we walked night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have the, that right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we will give you this command. If anyone is not willing to walk, let him not eat. Um, uh, here we see clearly the instruction to find something to do. We see the instruction to be diligent in our work. And we also see that we should be um, exemplary in our workplace, wherever sector, wherever it is that we find ourselves. That as believers, we should be the examples there, right? Uh, whether as a tailor, a mechanic, a carpenter, whatever profession it is, you should be the perfect example that people are looking at when it comes to work ethic. You shouldn't be the one that every day, like, there's always a comma and a question mark on you. As a believer, people should emulate work ethics from you, right? Um, so um, another question is here is, here is um, 
where do we draw the line so that we don't get obsessed with work? Because here Paul is just saying, make sure you're doing something, be diligent, be an example. So, uh, you know, you might be tempted to just keep throwing everything at it, that, you just, that the work just completely um, becomes your life, right? That's all you're doing. So where, how do we draw a line or where do we draw, the line, draw a line with being diligent at work, giving it our best, uh, putting our mind to it and not going the other way over doing it, right? And being obsessed with, with work. Where do we draw the line? Where, where do we find a balance? For me, I think the, for me, the balance is, you know, like um, Jesus would say, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. That's, that's the balance. And then secondly, do everything as unto God. You get what I'm saying? Don't, don't carry, don't carry what belongs to, to God and give it to, and give it to a man or to a company or to, you get what I'm saying? Um, like I mentioned the other day, um, when I was, when I was, I can't remember if, if, if it was during Bible study or oh, on Sunday, but I mentioned that there are two pitfalls in in this in, in this conversation. Number one is you, you either become idol at work, or you or you make your work an idol. Instead of the two, you can you can you can get to the pl- to a place where you hate your job so much, like you are literally dragging your feet every time at work. You are doing it because you just need the money. You hate it so much. Honestly, that's a problem because number one, you are not being fair to your boss. You are not being fair to people. You are not. Be, I mean, you are not doing it because you you really really want to solve the company's problem. You hate it. Every time it's Friday, TGIF. Every time on Sunday, I say, oh, tomorrow, another time to go to work again. You hate it. You get. Even though, even if you are doing everything at work, you are being idle at work, right? Because you are not doing it to the glory of God. And the correction to that is. To see everything as I'm, I'm here to glorify. I'm, I'm, even though I'm working for a man, even though I'm working with men, sorry, I'm actually working for God. You get what I'm saying? And then the the idol part again is this: don't allow any like you know. I, I gave an example with a guy that because he lost his job, he committed suicide. The job became an identity. Like you can't like uh, you know. I, I gave an example again with you know when we when, when we were small, we used to hear radio. They were saying that's when Geshe the Musa may say the tomatoes are by Kindogo. Like, you ca- if you take away tomatoes from, that, from Musa's life, he has no identity. It shouldn't be like that for believers. You get what I'm saying? So give to God what belongs to God. And give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. If you're at work and it's working hour, honestly, do the work as, on, do the work as, on to, do the work as, as if it's God you're working, working for. Let them feel your impact in that place. Let, let them feel your impact in that place. Even if it is a completely 100% secular organization, let them feel your impact. Let them, be, like, they should be able to say, before this guy came to this company, this, 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 this wasn't happening. But now, thank God we hired this guy. Honestly. Right? And at the same time, don't ever get to the place where that work is your God. You get what I'm saying, but And usually, people fall into one of the two. Usually. But as believers, let's put everything in their proper places. Amen. Amen. Anybody wants to add to that? Say something else. The most important thing is that, that you must remember that the purpose of work is to glorify God. If you always have that at the back of your mind, you are less likely to fall into the trap. Because when it becomes an idol, you know that that particular thing is no longer glorifying God. You are glorifying something else. So if you always have at the back of our mind that the purpose of work is to glorify God, we'll um, be able to find that balance. Verse 11 says, For we hear that some among you work in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. And uh, you know this saying that um, an idle man is a devil's workshop? It makes a lot of sense. Because sometimes if you uh, find people that are, you know, busy bodies are people that you always you are trying to just put your mind in everybody else's business. You want to see what's going on with this person, what's new here, what's happening here, what's this person wearing, and all of those things. It comes from a place of um, idleness. Because if you're truly focused on your work, both um, in the world and in the body of Christ, you won't have the time or the brain space to be thinking of all those other um, unimportant things. Um, so here... 
he's, uh, Paul is telling them, be so focused, be so diligent. Don't have the, the time or the brain space to even entertain unimportant things, right? That uh, your, your mind is always, either you're filled with the work you need to do to support yourself or to be a blessing to glorify God, even, or even the work that we have in the body of Christ. That in doing all of those things, that even helps you. If you are trying to, you know, um, quite being a gossip or a rumor monger or chief analyzer of people's life, that's a, that's a very good way to do it, to get busy with your own hands. The more you do that, the less you have the brain space or even the physical time to be able to do all of those things. So verse 12 says, Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. So Paul is saying to those people, that are still refusing to find something to do, that are still being busy bodies, this is a command that you should find something to do. And it's something that we should pay attention to. If we are still in that place that we've not yet found what we're supposed to do, whether in the workspace outside or even the body of Christ, um, Paul is encouraging us this morning that you find something to do and pay attention to. It's a command. He's not asking you whether you like it or not, or will you mind joining a... a a unit or a team at Light Talk is not is a command. You should find something to do. We should all find something to do. And I don't want us to just think of work outside, right, in the, se in the secular sector, but even work in the body of Christ. That we should find there are plenty of things to do. There's a lot of work to do. If you are looking for it, you can always say that you're looking for a place to serve. That's just the truth. Or you're waiting for them to tell you to do a particular thing. There are lots of places. We have a lot of opportunities here. And the command and the instruction to us is to find something and do it. Give yourself to that. That's how we are all um, giving to the body of Christ. We are all developing ourselves. We are all being better. And that deals with all those little issues or, or clashes that will come up in church. If we are all doing something or minding your business, you are not looking at whether they did not snap you uh, or in Sunday service. Or, that's like because you are doing, you are even doing, you don't even expect, you are not even looking at the picture in the first place. So you don't even expect that they should snap you because you are busy. right? That, that deals with all those little side talks and little side gist that just comes up. So the encouragement to us is find something to do. I like that almost everybody here is doing something, right? Or is in one team or another. Give it your best. Put your heart to it. Do it with the whole of your might. Don't wait um, for them to call you first so that you show up, okay, as a superstar. Now they called me to come and interview. Don't do that, right? Um, be, be proactive. See a space where you can serve, where you can impute, and just walk in and feel it quietly. Right? That's the, that's the command to us this morning. We've done that, but we should do uh, more. Verse 13 says, As for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. So for those of us that have been working, putting our hands to work, uh, Paul is encouraging us this morning, don't get tired. Don't say, it's only me. Every time, it's me. Every two, two minutes, it's me. Sweep chapel, is me. Yeah, clean the place. It's me. Every time they must come, I don't get tired of doing good. That's what Paul is encouraging us. This morning. Don't be weary. Don't say, ah, all the teams that always have one responsibility to do. There's no break. I'm, I'm tired. See this other person. The person is just crossing leg. They are not doing anything. The encouragement is don't be tired. Don't get weary of doing good. Um, somebody once said that the, the, purple, the reward for hard work is more work, and it's true. It doesn't seem fair, right? Like, maybe I should work some more and chill now. But that's just the truth. The reward of hard work is more work. And we shouldn't get tired, right? We shouldn't uh, feel overwhelmed. We should always be encouraged um, to do more. There's always room for doing more. Um, if you ever get to the point that you think, oh, you've done your last or done your best, then you won't be able to give in again or you won't be able to be more productive. So don't always, don't uh, allow yourself to get to that point where you think you've done the best that you can. There's always room to do better. There's always room for improvement. There's always room to do better. Verse 14, also you join that to verse 6, says, if anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and, that, and have nothing to do with him, that he may be ashamed. And we've discussed that, right? That the purpose of putting people aside is not to annihilate him or mark X or make them look like evil or devilish people. Is that they desire what we have and then they pick up the pace, right? That's the purpose of that. And if you remember the intention and the motive behind why you are doing something, you will do it with love and with grace and be gracious to the person. They are not just saying, oh, so you, you don't want to work. That's your own problem, right? And you judge and condemn the person. No, if you remember that the purpose is to get this person to following this command or following this instruction, you are, being, you are able to be gracious, you are able to be kind, even as you are keeping them aside or stepping them um, aside. Then, um, 
Verse 16 says, Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. The Lord be with you all. This is another um, beautiful prayer that Paul is praying. That God gives them peace at all times. And, and you know that's the interesting thing about peace. Peace is not the absence of trouble or absence of turmoil. It is that in the midst of all of that turmoil or trouble, that your heart is at rest because of where your confidence lies. And it's a beautiful thing for us to pray. Uh, even in the wake of all that's happening economically and all of that, that every morning when we, we wake up, we trust and we know that we enjoy God's peace because our eyes and our focus is on God, not on anything else, right? It's a beautiful and comforting prayer um, that Paul is praying here. And verse 17, last it says, Paul writes this greeting with my own hand. This is a sign of genuineness in every letter of mine. It is the way I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. So I don't know if there are any other comments or questions so that we will end here. Our time is fast. Um, any? Okay. So thank you.